All right, we've got another mailbag this week. You've got questions about the Goog, Notre Dame's next apparel brand, and even a sneaky villain figure that nobody's talking about. That's coming up next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome into Locked On Irish. It is Friday, June 16th. So happy Friday to each of you and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. As always, you can find the show on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. But whether you're watching or listening, I appreciate you joining me here today. Before you get your weekend started and all I ask is that you please subscribe to the channel if you have not already. I'm the host, Tyler Wojak. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, and I'm a producer at the Fox Sports headquarters in Los Angeles covering college football. I've also been podcasting about the football team since 2020. And since it's Friday, we're going to do another mailbag on today's show. Thanks, as always, to everyone uh, who's sending questions this week. We've got some good ones to get to. If you want your questions answered on future mailbags, send them in on Twitter, at Irish or slide in the DMs on Instagram, at Pod. Then at the end, I'm going to discuss Notre Dame's decision to discontinue a long-standing tradition for the male student body, the cancellation of inner hall tackle football. I played inner hall tackle football while I was a student and won a championship. No big deal. Um, so I was pretty disappointed when I heard the news. But then when I looked into it even further, I'd, it actually really pissed me off. And I'll tell you why in segment three. But first, let's get to your questions. So I got a couple questions about the Goog. Um, I'll just combine them both into one question here. So this one comes from Benno, who asks, with the new AD in charge, will Notre Dame update the Gook sooner or later than if Swarbrick stayed in the role? And then my mom, Sandra, shout out for staying in the know. Um, she wants to know, will Notre Dame ever update the Gook? So there's been a lot of talk about the Gook renovations lately. Uh, it's the off season. It's what we do. We complain. Um, and this conversation got even louder when former Notre Dame special teams coach Brian Polian explained to Tim Priester of Irish Illustrated all of the deficiencies of the current iteration of the Goog. You all probably have heard this by now. It's much smaller uh, than it should be because it was built during the Charlie Weiss era at a time when all of the additional support staff and all the new faces and all the new coaching staff that is a part of not just Notre Dame, but every college football program, um, it's just not built to staff all of those people. You've got guys eating in different areas, guys cramped in you know different academic stations and things like that. So it's in much need of a renovation. We all know this. And Jack Swarbrick has been on record saying he knows it too. And he said that it's been a priority. He actually told Tim Priester, who I mentioned earlier, that he fully understands that the Goog needs an update and uh, it's one of his top priorities. But Swarbrick is obviously on the way out and he has two more important things left on his plate before he steps down. He has to figure out the next TV deal and figure out who the apparel partner is going to be. As important as the Goog renovations are, I think those two are clearly more important and more pressing, at least, at this moment of time. Notre Dame really needs to figure out the next TV deal. I would bet every cent I have that it's going to be with NBC, especially considering that they just hired their former NBC Sports chairman, Pete Bavacqua, to replace Jack Swarbrick as the athletic director at Notre Dame. So that needs to happen soon. And the apparel partnership, uh, whoever Notre Dame ends up partnering with, that also needs to happen in the near future because the uh, exclusive window for Notre Dame to negotiate with Under Armour has been closed. It's been closed for about a month now. And Notre Dame is in the open market. And they need to get that squared away soon because they need to have that apparel partner lined up and everything prepared for launch by the time that Notre Dame's contract ends with Under Armour, which is after the end of next season. So those two things need to happen first. And another thing about the Goog renovations that I think goes over a lot of people's heads is it's not like the athletic department is in control of that entirely. That goes up all the way up to the top, and you're looking at Father Jenkins, the board of trustees, to figure out where all of that money that is being flooded into Notre Dame every single year. And trust me, it's a lot. But other people want to use that money for different uh, facilities and different things on campus as well. And I think it's a good, a good reminder that there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of alums, and a lot of people who work for Notre Dame and care a lot about the university that, frankly, couldn't give a shit about the football program. I don't get it. Um, I don't see why these people don't understand the benefit of having a really elite football program. Like, just look at Alabama. Look at the amount of people that apply to go to Alabama every single year now, ever since Nick Saban came on board and they start winning the national championship, like, every other year. It totally transformed the school. And it's a much better school now than it was before Nick Saban, and that's in large part because of the attention and money that the football program at Alabama brought in. So that's what I would say to the Board of Trustees. But again... I think that we, as football fans, people who care so much about the team and the university, don't 
always remember how many people also affiliated with the university who don't care, and they don't really think that it's that important for the Goog to be renovated. Now, this is a conversation that could go on and on and on, and, and trust me, I believe that Notre Dame should invest the money into the Goog, but I think that what, what is preventing it from being renovated is not Jack Swarbrick, not people in the athletic department who recognize how important it is for Notre Dame to update their facilities. It's the people in the board of trustees, the big donors, who frankly don't care as much about football. And Pete Bavacqua and Jack Swarbrick, I think they need to convince those people, and I'm sure that Swarbrick's done it. They were able to get the Irish Athletic Center built, which is very nice, state-of-the-art. They also, under Jack Swarbrick's watch, completely renovated the stadium and the campus crossroads project. So it's not like things aren't happening. And I would say that the people, and I'm assuming, I guess, is probably a better way to phrase it, that the people on the board, the people in charge of where this money is being spent, they're looking around and saying, hey, we just built you the Irish Athletic Center. We just renovated the stadium. Like It's, we're, it's not like we're not throwing money around. And while that's partially true, it doesn't tell the whole story and it doesn't keep up with the arms race that's going on in college football. So I think it's going to happen, but I think it's going to happen under Pete Bavacqua's watch because Jack Schwarberg has to get these other two things taken care of first, and that's going to be a very important step for Pete Bavacqua. And my only concern about him when he assumes the role of AD has nothing to do with him, and it's a short-term problem. I guess I'm just concerned about the urgency that the board is going to put into this when it's coming from the new guy, right? Like, how often do you have a new guy come in and all the bosses are like, well, this new guy is saying we need to do these things, so let's just get it done right away. That's not really how it works. I think Bavak is going to have some time to, you know, build relationships with those people in charge. He's going to have to fundraise, which... Um, by all reports, he's really good at, so that's encouraging, um, especially because Notre Dame operates in a way where they commit to a project, all of that money needs to be ready to go at the time of launch. So it's going to be a difficult task for Pete Bavacqua to do to get all these people on board, especially as the new face in the room. But I think that he has the chops to do it, he has the personality, and he has the intelligence and, and everything you would need to sort of convince those type of people and get these things done. I just don't know when it's going to happen. I just think it's going to probably be at least a year, honestly, before we get any new updates on that because of the other things going on. All right, so that was a long-winded answer. Let's get to the second one. Um, this one comes from T Short 99. Why do people want Jordan Brand? I can hear the scum fans saying they did it first. Scum, obviously, being Michigan fans. Um, well, the, the short answer is because it's cool, <laughs> like especially to young people. Simple as that. Jordan Brand is cool, it, the, and they're the most popular shoes in the world. Michael Jordan, the face of the company, is an iconic figure, not just in American society, but globally. Their merchandise is objectively way better than anything Under Armour has put out in years. And yeah, I understand why some people might think it's weird seeing a basketball player on a football uniform. I get that, uh, but I can get over that, honestly. I think if that's what's holding us up here, that's something that we, we can get over. We'll, we'll forget about, we'll forget it's even happening, right? It's like when they started putting advertisements on NBA jerseys, everyone threw up their arms like, what, how are they going to do that? That's going to take away everything and it's going to look ridiculous. And I don't ever notice the ads on NBA jerseys now. Maybe you do, but I, I don't. Okay, so I think that you just kind of get used to it and then you forget it's even there. So not only is it cool, not only does it appeal to everything that I was just talking about, it's also better equipment because it's a sister company of Nike and Nike has better equipment than Under Armour. So I guess my question back to you, T-Short 99, would, would you really want an objectively worse partner just because Michigan did it first? Like, who cares if some Twitter trolls uh, from the Michigan side of things say that, oh, Notre Dame is trying to be like Michigan because they went to Jordan. So there, there's a bunch of other Jordan programs out there as well. I was just at Oklahoma, their Jordan brand, and th there's a big Jordan logo right when you walk into the football facilities. But guess what? All the gear looks super cool. So I don't really care about the giant oversized Jordan logo when you walk in. I've been on record saying I want Notre Dame to go with Nike or Jordan, and I think that's hopefully where things are trending. I don't think Notre Dame is going to go back to Adidas. Um, I haven't heard anything that would suggest Notre Dame is trending in that direction. I also think that they've already been there, done that type of thing, so it's probably time to try something new. I think Notre Dame has made it clear that they want to be a priority partner. That was a big reason why they went to Under Armour in the first place, because they were everything to Under Armour at the time. And even though Nike and Jordan have other schools, I think that you know, any of these apparel partners, if they sign with Notre Dame, Notre Dame will become a priority. And I think Notre Dame is ready for Nike, Nike is ready for them, or Jordan. Pretty much the same thing, just different logo, at, at least as I perceive it. So I think uh, I think Notre Dame will probably go in one of those two directions, and I frankly don't care, T-Short 99, that a couple of Michigan fans are going to say anything because, what, they're our rival. They're going to trash talk us regardless. If it's not about Jordan, it's about it's going to be about something else. And you know that. I know it. So I think we'll get over that pretty quickly. All right, here's a brief message from our sponsors, then we'll get back to your questions. 
This episode of Lockdown Irish is brought to you by Bird Dogs. I've raved about Bird Dog shorts before in the podcast, and I'm here to do it again because they're just that good. Not only do they make you look better, they're way more comfortable than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. So, not only can you wear these shorts to the gym, but you could wear them on the golf course, out to lunch, really, wherever you want. Not only that, when you go to birddogs.com slash college, they'll throw in a free Yeti-style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash college for a free Yeti-style tumbler. I know before on the podcast I mentioned that you had to enter a promo code in order to get that tumbler. Not anymore. All you have to do is go to birddogs.com slash college, and the tumbler is going to be applied to every order. So get to birddogs.com ASAP. Get yourself some new shorts and a nice coffee tumbler to go along with them. And once your shorts arrive, you won't want to take them off. That's a promise. Thanks again for making Lockdown Irish your first listen of the day. Before we get to the mailbag questions, I wanted to let you know that Lockdown's NBA Mock Draft Special is here, and it's bigger than ever. Follow along the entire first round in a six-episode Ultimate Mock Draft experience that only Lockdown can deliver. All episodes are available now on Lockdown NBA Big Board on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, now let's get back to your questions, and this first one comes from a guy who you probably have heard before. He goes by the name of Luke Smith, and Luke wants to know, is Mike Elko a sneaky, underrated villain figure? Takes the bag to leave South Bend and joins Jimbo at Texas A&M. Now convincing recruits to go to Duke over Notre Dame while building the Blue Devils into a trendy dark horse pick to upset the Irish this fall. And this pre-hard rock debacle, and I'll play the clip now. So if you don't remember, that clip uh, was before the Notre Dame-Miami game in 2017 when Notre Dame ended up getting dominated by the Hurricanes in Hard Rock, and Mike Elko was caught on a hot mic trying to get his team ready to play, and obviously they were not ready to play that Saturday. So as for the question, he actually is kind of becoming a sneaky underrated villain figure, but I wouldn't say it's because of the recruiting. It sounded like uh, Paul Menke, who is the recruiting question here, who ultimately chose Duke over Notre Dame, talked about him before on this podcast and his official visit that took place a couple weeks ago. Notre Dame was expecting to get a commitment from him uh, that weekend, and it sounded like they thought they were going to get one. It didn't happen, and then they only have so many safety spots left in the class. Tay Johnson announced his commitment date, which suggests that Notre Dame is certainly trending in the right direction for him. So I think that he might have just lost his spot. I don't think that Duke was able to convince him to go to Duke over Notre Dame. I don't think that's the case based on the stuff that we... Honestly, the stuff that's been reported out there. So I don't think he's getting guys over Notre Dame. But yeah, when he left Notre Dame for Texas a that was really tough. But I can't really hate him too much because it did seem like he got a giant pay increase by going to Texas A&M. And even though it sucked in the time, it actually ended up being somewhat good for Notre Dame because one, uh, Mike Elko did give us Clark Lee and then we promoted Clark Lee and he was great at that job and we miss him. Uh, and then another good reason uh, is because once Elko left, I think it was a wake up call, not just to the coaching staff, who I'm sure Brian Kelly was already um, campaigning to get his assistants paid more. But I think it was a wake-up call for the athletic department and really the university that, hey, it's time to start paying assistants a little bit more because we're going to get outbid again, and this cannot happen. And that, I think, eventually led to getting Marcus Freeman because we were able to pay up enough so that he didn't take LSU over Notre Dame. And now he's the head coach, who we all like at this point in time. So even though he left us, I think that he it ended up being a good thing for Notre Dame. Now, if Duke ends up beating Notre Dame this year. This is going to be an entirely different conversation. Or if he starts bad-mouthing Notre Dame a la Pat Narduzzi, then yeah, I would consider him a sneaky villain figure. But for now, I'm not going to call him a villain just yet. All right, next one. Jack P., which stadium would be the coolest place to see the Irish play in a away game? Can't be one they've played at already. All right, the first one is easy for me. It's LSU. Uh, for sure. And this is regardless of Brian Kelly coaching or not. Everyone I know who has been to LSU says it's, it's an experience unlike any other in college football. I've been pretty fortunate to be able to attend um, a lot of different away games, not just for Notre Dame. I've been to some games for work where Notre Dame wasn't playing and I got to see some cool stadiums. I have not been to LSU yet. That is on my bucket list. And uh, like I said, man, it's one of those things where everyone talks about it in such a high regard that it's almost like going to Augusta for the Masters now. Like the expectations could not be any higher, basically, especially at night. LSU at night um, is like a different environment. Like it's always great, but people say that's even better. So hopefully maybe down the road, Notre Dame can get a night game at LSU. I don't know if they've played there before, but it hasn't happened during my lifetime. So that's going to be my number one. Number two is Wisconsin for me. I think that would be awesome. And even though it's going to be cool that Notre Dame is going to play Wisconsin at Lambeau in a couple of years, they were supposed to do it during the COVID year. It really bummed me out that they decided to do that home and home at NFL stadiums. Like 
in my mind, it would have been way cooler to watch Notre Dame beat Wisconsin in Notre Dame Stadium than at Soldier Field. Like, Soldier Field is a dump. Um, it's in a cool location, but it's impossible to get to, and it's just not a great place to watch a game. So it was a bummer that that game happened there instead of Notre Dame Stadium. And, yeah, Lambeau's going to be cool, but, man, it'd be awesome to go to Madison and watch a game there. I've never been there, but that's another place where everyone who has been raves about it, so I wish Notre Dame was going to play there instead. So that would be a number two. Uh, sneaky one at number three. I've heard Oregon is really cool. It's a bit smaller. I think it only holds like 53,000, but at its peak, it can get super, super loud. And it would be a long way for most of Notre Dame fans, but not that far from me because I'm on the West Coast. So I'll put Oregon three. Four, Notre Dame is going to play at Alabama here in a few years. And I buy a few years. I think it's like eight. I don't remember the exact year. But anyway, Alabama's cool. Like it's a really unique campus. Uh, but my one issue with Alabama Stadium, like Brian Denny's cool. But it's very corporate. It almost feels like an NFL stadium. And when I went there, the first time they were playing Kentucky, and they beat the hell out of Kentucky. And, and the the intrigue from the fans was just not that great because they knew they were going to dominate them, and then they did. But then I was at that Alabama-LSU game in 2019 with the Joe Burrow year, all that. And that was Joe Burrow, Tua, NFL players at practically every single position. And LSU had not won against Bama in a really long time, especially at Bryant Denny, and they did. And that atmosphere was crazy. And I imagine that if Notre Dame went to Alabama and both teams were pretty good, then the atmosphere would be maybe not at that level because I think both teams were in the top three at the time, but it would be close. And I think that would be really, really cool. Um, a couple other places. I'm going to cheat here and say Tennessee because even though I know Notre Dame played at Tennessee – uh, not that long. I think it was like 2004, early to, like early 2000s. Anyway, uh, I was pretty young for that. And Tennessee is the coolest stadium I've ever been to. I saw them beat Jadavion Clowney when he was at South Carolina and they were a top 10 team on a game-winning field goal. That was awesome. Also, Notre Dame played at Penn State in 2007. They also played at the Rose Bowl against UCLA that same year. I don't think we talk enough about how those are two wasted opportunities for just all-time classic road games because Notre Dame was just so bad. And UCLA was really bad that year too. But man, that would be really, really cool to do again when both teams are actually good. Like Notre Dame at Penn State for a whiteout would be awesome if Notre Dame isn't completely terrible, which they were in 2007. So that's my list. Okay, next up here. This one comes from Danny F. who says, Siegfried alum here, will Mod Quad exist in 15 years? I was a little confused by this question. Uh, I think it will. Why wouldn't it? But then again, Notre Dame is certainly not afraid to cancel some traditions, which I'll get to in segment three. But if I'm not mistaken, Mod Quad is one right behind the library. And I wasn't really over there a ton. I lived in Dillon, so I was uh, mostly in the South Quad. And I was only living on campus one year, so... I didn't spend a lot of time in my mod quad, but I think it's going to exist unless there's some new construction projects that I don't know. I know that they're building a lot more dorms to, in, to house all of those extra students because once they put that rule in place that undergraduate students had to be on campus for three years, uh, they had to get some dorms up in a hurry because there just weren't enough for everyone. When I was transferring to Notre Dame, they actually did not even guarantee us on-campus housing. And uh, that was a fun little waiting game. It's just like, hey, you got in, congrats. I don't know if we can house you yet. And then we just had to wait. And even though I moved off campus before my junior year, I wanted to do the on-campus thing at least one year. Unfortunately, I was able to get on. So I don't know. I, I Maybe I'm out of the loop here. I did graduate five years ago. Wow, I really am getting old. But uh, I think it's going to exist. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. Okay, this one comes from Scott W., who asks... You've talked in great deal about Notre Dame's need for more depth at the receiver position, and yet I'm not hearing anything about a fantastic high school player that's going unnoticed out of Cleveland, Ohio, Jack Wojak. Jack Wojak is the key receiver, running back, kick returner, punter, safety, and overall athlete for the Medina Bees. Do you know why he, we don't hear about Jack on the Notre Dame recruitment radar? So if you haven't figured out yet, the person asking this question is my dad, and Jack Wojak, the person in question here, is my cousin. There's not a lot of Wojaks out in the world, at least not spelled W-O-J-C-I-A-K. Well, Jack is one of them, and he's a damn good football player. So I don't know why he's not getting enough attention, to be honest. He went to the same high school as Drew Alar, the Penn State quarterback who Notre Dame looked at. So it's not like they're unfamiliar with Medina. Also last year, Medina beat Menor during the regular season, which is the school where Brennan Vernon, the incoming freshman, went to. So I know the Notre Dame staff was watching that game, and Jack had a couple of touchdowns in a really good game, and that was just one of many really awesome games he had last year. So I actually think he's going to be on campus soon for the camp. Maybe that's when he'll be uh, brought on the scene. And look, Jack is my cousin. This is a shameless plug, and I'm not going to go full baby Gronk's dad and start DMing 
literally anyone and everyone on social media to get him some attention, but I will use this podcast to shine some light on him. He's a stud football player. He's going to kill it a senior season, and Notre Dame should be looking at him a lot harder, as well as all the other top D1 programs because he's a stud. So there you have it. That is all the questions for this week's mailbag, but stick around for segment three because I've got some thoughts about Notre Dame's cowardly decision to cancel Inner Hall Tackle Football. That's coming up next. All right, before we wrap up the show, I feel like I need to address the situation at Notre Dame regarding men's Inner Hall Tackle Football. So in case you were unaware, Notre Dame was one of the few schools left in the entire country, I think one of the only non-military academy school that still had full contact, full pad, intramural tackle football. At Notre Dame, they did it by the dorm. So you'd play for your dorm with other uh, people who lived in the dorm, or if you moved off campus, you could still play for your dorm team, at least when I was there. That might have changed, but I'll get to that in a second. So anyway, it's a really long-standing tradition. When I went back and researched it before doing this podcast, I found that the first year of the men's interhall tackle football was 1890. This has been going on for over 100 years at Notre Dame, and it's one of the very unique aspects of the student culture. And I played, as I mentioned at the top, I had a ton of fun doing it, and I was really, really disappointed when I heard the news. Yes, I understand that it's dangerous. I honestly am a little bit surprised that it took this long, given the fact that, you know, the culture that we're in and the liability of playing football, I get it, it's dangerous. We all knew that when we signed up to play. We all know the risk when you strap up the pads and play football that you could suffer a serious injury. And as a matter of fact, in my very first ever inner hall game, uh, when I was playing for Dylan, my good buddy, Dave Durkin, shout out Dave, he got hurt really bad early in the game. Like maybe my first quarter playing interhall attack football, Dave goes up to catch an interception, comes down awkwardly, breaks his leg, really bad stuff, really tough day at the field. And I had a moment there. I was like, wait, is this a good idea? Should I really be playing this? I haven't played tackle football in a couple of years. Like the first time you get hit is like a shock. Even though I played football for pretty much my entire life, getting hit again after a two-year break, it's an adjustment. And I'm not going to lie, the the quality of play on the field is is not stellar. <laughs> Let's put it that way. When I won the championship, the final score was two to nothing. Um, it's kind of like watching freshman football at the high school level because there's not that many kids. I think our roster only, you could only have like 24 people or something like that. Um, and it was a really, really fun experience. And I'm just so disappointed that future Notre Dame students will not be able to participate. So when I heard this news, I was upset. But then when I looked into it further, it it just, it really bothered me. So here's here's what the letter said. This was, this was a portion of the letter that was sent out by Father Jerry Olinger, the Vice President of Student Affairs. Quote, in recent years, undergraduate student involvement in the ITFB program has decreased dramatically. Notably, since the reintroduction of the program following the corona pandemic, student participation has fallen to just 269 students in the fall of 2022, compared to 370 in 2017. At the same time, since the introduction of 7-on-7 flag football as a men's inner hall sport in 2019, participation has risen by 42%, resulting in an increase from 18 men's flag football inner hall teams to 23. The study also revealed that a large percentage, 44%, of participants had no previous experience in organized tackle football prior to their involvement into the, in the ITFB program, while 49% of participants had three or four years of experience playing tackle football in high school. End quote. So, if we take this for its word, that students weren't playing um, in our hall tackle football as much, and a good chunk of the kids that were playing had no prior experience playing tackle football, that by itself would make sense for why you would cancel it. Although, I would say that 269 students is a lot of students who want to play tackle football. But there's a key component that this letter is missing, and that's this administration and the university's role in reducing the amount of students who are participating. So once this got released, I saw on Twitter, and some people hit me up when I commented on it, that recently, since I graduated, so at some point in the past five years, maybe after the COVID pandemic, Notre Dame made the decision that if you lived off campus, you could not participate in inner hall sports. That is a huge deal, especially for football. That was not the case when I was there. This is especially important for inner hall football because most of the kids playing are upperclassmen because I think a lot of 18-year-old kids are like, hey, I don't know if I want to play tackle football right away against guys who are like 22, 23 because the, you know, the difference in body type for an 18 and 22, 23-year-old is pretty significant. So I'd understand why a freshman isn't jumping at joining the team right away, although there were, there were plenty of freshmen who did play when I was there. But 
if Notre Dame essentially said, hey, seniors can't play, well, no shit, the participation is going to go down. Of course it is. And then I think that there's a lot of kids, juniors um, and seniors who do live on campus, who wanted to play. It's a really cool thing. So they probably went around the dorm and were recruiting kids to join the team who are kids who are probably good athletes, but maybe they didn't have experience playing football just so that they could reach the amount of numbers necessary to play the to play the game. So, look, I'm not there. I'm not a student anymore. But based on everything I've heard and what I'm reading, it sounded like that the Notre Dame administration just basically forced their hand into making this happen. And it's ridiculous, okay? They're robbing students of a really cool experience because of something that they did. Yeah, I get it. Kids who have never played football before probably shouldn't be playing tackle football at the inner hall level because there are kids who have, and yes, it's dangerous, and I get all of that. But you can't cite student participation as the reason that you don't want to do it anymore when you are the reason that student participation is down. That's ridiculous, and it's unfair. So, look, it really bothered me. It's a, Again, it's a long-standing tradition. I had so much fun playing inner hall football. Not only that, when I transferred over, a lot of the kids who I met playing inner hall football are now some of my close friends today, and we've stayed in touch. And maybe we would have been friends regardless of inner hall football, but it was a good way to meet people, especially for young kids, and it was an unbelievable experience playing in the stadium. I probably sound like the biggest hardo in the world right now talking about the glory days of playing intramural or inner hall sports. I get it. You know what? I'm fine with it, okay? It was really cool. And are there people who probably took it a little bit too seriously? Yeah. Some of them were on my team. And if they're listening, they know who they are. Some of them weren't even playing, and they still took it seriously. But you know what? That's what made it so fun is because people cared, because it was cool, and playing in the stadium was fun. I coached women's inner hall. It was awesome. They get to play in the stadium too. Maybe they make an amendment so now the whoever wins or whoever's playing in the championship in the flag league gets to play in the stadium. I would hope that they do that because it is truly – a once in a lifetime experience for a student who is, you know, obviously not on the football team to be able to strap them up and play inside the stadium. It's one of my favorite memories from my time as a student. And I think it's absolutely criminal that the school is going to rob students from experiencing that again. Because even though it's going to be cool playing flag in the stadium, there was something different about knowing that you were going to hit somebody in Notre Dame Stadium and people from the actual team came by, other students came by. Hell, my parents and other parents who were in the crowd, they stuck around because you play it the game after the the last home game of the season. So uh, Notre Dame played Navy in 2018. It was maybe, or excuse me, 2017. Maybe the ugliest game I've ever witnessed in person at Notre Dame Stadium. And then the next day we played, and it was freezing cold. I was pretty violently hungover because we were out till 4 a.m. the night before celebrating our last home game uh, as students. And it was just an unbelievable weekend. And now some kids out there who go to Notre Dame aren't going to be able to experience that, who, who probably would have wanted to. And, uh, That's pretty upsetting. So even though it's an unfortunate note to end the podcast on today, that is going to do it for me today. And that's another week of Lockdown Irish in the Books. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Quick heads up before I go. I'm about to head to Cleveland for my grandma's 80th birthday. So everyone wish my grandma Woj a happy birthday. Then I'm going from Cleveland to Miami for a little vacation. So I'm going to be off work for a bit. And I won't have another episode out until probably Thursday of next week. So enjoy the weekend. Be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, please subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown Irish, on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler W O J C I A K. Enjoy the weekend, everybody, and I will see you next week.